a Living History production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and uh, the second instalment of uh, Living History from Isolation. Uh, and joining me today remotely via Zoom is someone that you know and love from the podcast. Uh, it's Mr. Peter Hart. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Glad to be back. Glad to be back. Back on the podcast. And I should, a couple of housekeeping things first is that if you haven't gone over and listened to Peter Hart's podcast, uh, Peter Hart's Military History, absolutely make sure you do that because... It's been brilliant so far, Pete. You and Gary Bain are doing some wonderful stuff on that podcast. Are you enjoying doing your own podcast? I am. I, 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 I couldn't have done it on my own is the, the basic thing because I, I, I don't have the ability to think in a straight line, keep, keep to the subject. I would have wandered off into sort of rubbish. Uh, but Gary keeps you on the straight and narrow. He's very well informed. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, and he's happy to, to take a back seat. We're hoping to bring him forward with a couple where he'll be leading a bit more. Uh, but he's done a great job. He's fantastic. Um, but he is a bit of he is a bit overweight. I, I don't want it all to be. <laughs> that, that might have come out in an episode or two of the podcast. Just for those who haven't heard it, I strongly suggest you uh, jump on and, and uh, start subscribing to Peter Hart's military history. But it's Peter and his good mate Gary, and basically the the way I describe it is it's almost like two blokes sitting in the pub just rabbiting on about military history, and you get the pleasure as a listener of <laughs> eavesdropping on that whole thing. So it's fantastic. I really love it. If only, <laughs> Matt. If only. <laughs> Um, and no th- pubs for us. Thank you for joining me today uh, in the midst of isolation to uh, to do a recording, a, a podcast episode that I'm really looking forward to. It's a subject that I know a bit about, but not a lot. Um, we're going to talk about Gallipoli and the great storm that, that, that hit the Gallipoli Peninsula uh, very late in the campaign. But I should also mention that this is part of a book that you are doing all about the Gallipoli evacuation, which is going to be published by us, Living History. This is really exciting. Hooray. It's going to be the first book that we are going to publish as Living History. So it is going to go out and it'll be exclusively available to people who listen to the podcast and follow everything else that we do online. So really exciting that you've been working on this book for us, Peter. And it's coming out the second half of the year and we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, it's been great fun to write because... Uh uh, it it's just it's just a topic that you know when you, when I wrote my book on Gallipoli it, it was interesting but I didn't wasn't able to go into the detail I wanted to uh, and also just to tell the stories because it, it's such a tense time the evacuation so you know and there's so much happening um, that I just wanted to really get in amongst it and get some detail get some great stories and uh, and your book the book you're allowing me to write for you is uh, is giving me that chance great stuff looking yeah, forward to it I can't wait to read it and this is this is one obviously vital aspect of that whole story about the evacuation of Gallipoli is the the great storm. Um, And so let's dive in. I want to know a little bit about this. Can you maybe just paint a picture for us? What was happening at Gallipoli after, we all know about the big August offensive, the Battle of Lone Pine, the Battle of the Neck, the huge diversionary actions up into the heights. After that all fell over, what was going on at Gallipoli from August onwards? Because we don't really hear much about that in terms of what was even happening at Gallipoli. Well, the whole campaign was, to use a a technical term, buggered. Uh, It was absolutely done for. Uh, There was no chance of progress at Helles, uh, no chance at Anzac, no chance at Suvla. Um, And what were they going to do then? I mean, they were on the Western Front, September 25th, they're going to fight the Battle of Luce, where the British are playing a small part in the major Allied offensive of the year. What, what, you know... um, so they, they couldn't send a load more divisions. They, 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 they had commitments on the Western Front. So it, oh, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? And <clears throat> people start to think, well, perhaps we should get out. And, uh, and Kitchener asks Hamilton, the commander-in-chief of the, uh, of the, of the forces, the Gallipoli forces, um, how many men do you think you'll lose? And Hamilton won't even consider it. Won't. So they sack him, you know sack Hamilton and they replace him with Sir Charles Munro. Now Sir Charles Munro is a much better soldier. Uh, I like Hamilton. He's an he's an attractive character if you like, but there's a lot wrong with him as well. And spe- he was past his sell by date if you like uh, at the time. I think he was younger than I am. But never mind. <laughs> um he was that's what I mean about getting distracted. Uh he um uh, Munro 
I mean, Churchill said he came, he saw, he capitulated. He came to the peninsula, he saw all three bases, Helles, Anzac, Suvla, in a single day. And he just looked at it, he said, what the bloody hell? You know, to a practical soldier, he didn't have to go inland. He didn't have to go up into the trenches. He could see because logistics is everything in warfare. And the logistics at Gallipoli were hanging on a thread. And to use a famous phrase from a TV programme that I'm sure you watch, Matt, uh, winter was coming. And, and that's the subject of this podcast. Winter is coming. They're, they're there. What, 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 what port are they using? Well, they're using uh, Alexandra, really. That's 600 miles away. I'm not good at figures, so <laughs> we'll, we'll guess for 600, eh? Um, Imbros, that's the nearest. That's not a port. That's just a, you know, a bay. Um, and, and they've got a makeshift fort there. Uh, Mudros Harbour, that's a better harbour. But that's 60 miles away. Imbros is uh, 12 miles away. What? And the actual beaches, the beaches, are, they've just got piers, and makeshift piers and wharfs. So they're very vulnerable to a storm. So what always happens in life if you don't want something to happen, Matt? <laughs> like a, a dreadful world it, pandemic, for instance. It occurs. <laughs> when you at least want it to occur, it occurs. And, and, and that's what happens here. So... The, the winter's coming. They're terrified. They've had a couple of storms that have already smashed up a load of lighters. In fact, some of those lighters are still on the beaches today. W Beach, that lighter there, was one the one smashed up from the storms in October. Never mind November. And as they start to get through to November, what you get is the uh, the peninsula is a lovely Mediterranean climate, as you and I well know. We love going there, and we still hope to go together in late September. I think I think we might be lucky, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, uh, but the point is, you know, the, the Mediterranean benign, lovely, warm environment. When it gets to winter, it's it's not that that influences the climate at uh, Gallipoli. It's the Russian steppes. Now, like everything else Russian in, in, in myth or reality, it's cold and forbidding. The, those north uh, eastern winds come howling in. Uh, the temperature drops like a stone and it can be very, very nasty. And it had already started to get cold. And before we go on, uh, you know, you and I know, how well do you think the troops were prepared in their uniform and equipment for this? How, you know, you, well, how, what do you think? It's a, it's a point that I think we really should make, not just to do with how the troops were physically equipped, but... Gallipoli itself, you said when Munro arrived and had one quick look around and went, this is a disaster. We cannot overstate how far short of expectations the reality at Gallipoli was. You know, the, the plan was to land and within days have the peninsula secured. And now we're six, seven, eight months later and they've barely got a toehold in some of these places. I mean, we, we just cannot overstate how far short of their objectives they were at Gallipoli by this stage, can we? You can't, and and and, uh, and I think you put it to me, and I always pinch it now. You know, day one, I meant to take Achi Baba and uh, Maltepe, the the, the Anzacs, uh, the British and the Anzacs. Day two, they meant to take Kilid Bahia Plateau. Day three, pass the fleet through the Straits, and then, as you say, tea and scones, beer and skittles in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople. Well, here we are, months later, and they haven't even taken the village on the way to Achi Baba, never mind anything else. At Anzac, they're still on Second Ridge, which is, I mean, you've been there, we've been there loads of times. It, it's its just, you know, what is it? A kilometre inland, if that. It's not a beachhead, is it? The thing that I can't stress enough is the combination of how precarious the Allied positions were at Gallipoli, that at any stage they were at risk of being pushed back into the sea. But also the terrain itself at Gallipoli, the whole peninsula is like it's it's like a landslide in progress, isn't it? It's everywhere you go there. It's nothing but washaways and gullies. You can tell when you stand there, even in the middle of summer on a dry day, you'll stand in a dry riverbed and you'll look at this and you'll go, this is a place that at the wrong time of the year will have tons of water streaming through it. The whole peninsula feels like it could be swept away at any moment in a big storm. They were just so unprepared for bad weather. They were. They'd, I mean, they'd started digging winter dugouts, but they hadn't got far along it. Uh, but yes, at, at uh, um, Hellas is riven by uh, f three gullies, four gullies, if you count Keras uh, You know, uh, one of them is particularly deep. Anzacs just wash away his gullies everywhere. Uh, and Suvla, funnily enough, has the most potential because it's a flat plain. 
but the hills are all round it. That where the water can gary, gather and then rush down the shallow valleys and flood the whole plain. If this, you know, it, 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 it's all an accident waiting to happen. And the weather. This is when it starts, uh, 26th of November. If you don't, the, 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 the morning's overcast and the wind is whistling in from the northeast and it's getting stronger and stronger and the cold's getting worse. And, you know, the, one, you know, the tents on the beach at Anzac and, and at Suvla, by the, again, by the, the C Beach and A Beach, uh, the, the, every tent straining at its tent ropes and there's blokes going around with tent pegs hammering them in everywhere to try, you know, to stop the tents blowing away. And a lot of the men talk about a sort of foreboding of evil. Now, I'll be honest with you, this is hindsight in, in one sense, because you've always got to watch this with personal experience, because, you know, if something happens, you say, well, I thought it might be going to happen, that kind of thing. But this is a quote from a private Thomas of the Third East Anglian Field Emmons. He was at Suvla and he said, as the afternoon wore on, great banks of sombre cloud began to gather on the horizon and a stillness settled down over the coast, which accentuated the occasional stabbing crash of isolated gunfire. The sea turned to the colour of lead and moaned eerily along the shingle. Steadily the darkness increased and now and then a warm gust of stale air would shake the canvas walls of the tent as i looked at the bank of sulphurous blackness i heard the moan of the sea and felt the ominous atmosphere of a strained stillness and one of them says it's a bit like you know the, the sort of silence they imagined across europe before the black death which is a particularly relevant quote now i should have read that one actually i now think but uh, you know but you get the idea they could sense something's coming and the rain starts about four o'clock in the afternoon, 1600. And it seemed like it would never stop. You know, it's just one of those torrential monsoon-like downpours. I understand you you don't have a lot of rain in Australia, so you might not know what I'm on about. But if you you can just imagine it, you know, put put the shower on, put it on full and point it at your head. You've got it. Um, and uh, it, it's heavy thunder and lightning. A continuous downpour, and they they dug drains. Of course, they dug drains. You know, in front of them, but they're soon flooded, uh, and it it's it's got a sort of biblical intensity. Um, and you know those gull gullies and nullers, those dry gullies and nullers, they stop being dry, <laughs> and and uh, and the water starts rushing down. And Sergeant Lane, Royal Engineer, says after six hours of the most severe rain, hail, thunder, and lightning, all trenches were filled to a depth of six feet of water, and those of the troops who could not swim were drowned. As it was night then, with the result that it was every man for himself. The water had now reached such a height that it resembled a great waterfall washing down the hillsides past new positions and into the sea, flooding and battering down, dugout after dugout, and either drowning or burying any occupant who happened to be inside. Lots of people were trapped inside their dugouts, couldn't get out. The dugout would collapse and they'd be smothered, drowned. Awful. You, you, you remember Joe Murray. I've often talked about Joe Murray. He's a, a recording I did, uh, 21, 21, 22 hours back in 1983, 4, uh, when I was a young sprig of a lad, about your age now. And... Um, and Murray described in Gully Ravine. You know Gully Ravine? I do know and well. The water, the water gathered at the top. Yeah, we walked up through, through it uh, together. Uh, the gather, and, and suddenly it would rush down. It'd come to a trench line where they had a barricade, and then it would form a reservoir behind it. You see what I mean? And then suddenly it would break and then go whooshing down and it was carrying, and Murray says it was carrying, you know, there were corpses, there were, there were uh, equipment, rifles, everything carried down in a, and then it would stop at the next one, you know, border barricade, all these barricades across, um, uh, redoubt C, redoubt B, it would stop for a bit and then break it and go whooshing down. If you were caught up in it and everyone was scrambling to get up, you know the sides of the gully, how steep they are? They were scrambling to get out of the gully. It was it was pretty awful. Um, that's the worst example of the... But on the, on the Suvla Plains, it's just awful. Um, here's a quote. And there's another enemy for them as well. You know how they were close to the sea? I always wonder about people who build things close to the sea. You Australians do it as well. Because the sea can move. You know, and this is a quote from Thomas. And he'd come back from duty and he got 
all the little tents had blown away, but there was some big marquees. So he got in a big marquee and he's, he, he finds a little piece of space and settles down to sleep. He says, uh, I found a few eight vacant inches at the seaward extremity of one tent and stripping off tunic, trousers, puttees and boots, lay down in a wet shirt under a wet blanket and tried to sleep. I was so tired I achieved the feat, impossible though it may seem. Suddenly I received a rude awakening. There was a crash and a roar. I woke to find myself struggling in the sea. A huge wave had dashed up the beach, invaded the tent, and was retiring with what booty it would have been able to reach. I and my scattered garments had formed part of the bag. In other words, he's, you, know, you know how the sea comes, rushes in, and then it was dragging him towards the sea. Amazing. And a flood you might have been able to cope with. You, you know, get wet. You get dry next day, don't you? What's the problem? But about one o'clock on uh, Saturday, the 27th of November, the next day, you know, after about six hours, the rain stops, but then the wind really comes from the cold northeast and the the temperatures drop like a stone. They drop and drop and drop well below zero. It's awful. Everything freezes and it begins to snow. (laughs) Bloody hell. Um, they're all in their thin, well, most of them are in their thin summer uniforms, remember. Suvla, Anzac and Hellas, mostly in thin khaki drill. And the, everywhere was glistening with ice. People were falling over, but that was the least of their problems. You know, everything froze. So if you took your great coat off to make a pillow or anything, it froze. It was solid like a board, rock hard like a board. Uh, People weren't firing much, but, you know, it was awful. The Turks are facing exactly the same problem. And we often ignore the Turks. So I'm going to have a little quote from the Turks. This is 2nd Lieutenant Mehmed Fazir. He was 2nd Battalion, 47th Regiment. And he says, flakes gently float down. Snowflakes. Since the temperature is below zero degrees centigrade, snow turns to ice. Through, though the brazier glows, it's unable to dispel the cold in our dugout. Go out and tour trenches. Feel sorry for my men. If this continues, what condition are we going to be in? Our conclusion is that there aren't many who could take this sort of life. If one has to put up with such conditions, there's no solution but to become as philosophical as a wandering dervish, completely bereft of worldly ambitions and concerns, which is just a mad quote, which I just like. But then I do like quotes like that. This isn't a cold snap. This is a a deep freeze. And it was bad at Hellas. It was bad at Anzac. But we're going to focus on Suvla because here it's, you know, the, the film, that the perfect storm. It, it's just because it's flat. They've got more water rushing down from the hills. Uh, the flat valley, a, a, a huge area is flooded. Uh, they're, they're in cold water. It's, it's, it's ice cold water. It's actually slush, mainly mud. Uh, and... You know when you're waiting for the bus? Oh, sorry, you're rich. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> yeah, you won't be after this, will you? <laughs> um, you know, you have to wait for, you know, it's, it's, say, in England, it's been snowing and you have to wait at a bus. I remember waiting at a bus stop, you know, with the snow falling on my bald head. I remember thinking, I'm all right. You know, and then after a quarter of an hour, yeah, I'm all right. After half an hour, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> and then after about an hour, because it was, a real screw up. I was almost in tears. It was awful. Well, that, that's a cold snap and a bit of snow. Imagine, just imagine the deep, the penetrating cold. You know, you, you can stamp your feet all you like, but you're stamping it in freezing water. Pete, this is the thing. This is the thing that strikes me about this whole chapter of the Gallipoli story. It's just so unexpected. Every photo we see of Gallipoli is Anzacs in cut off shorts and shirts because it's so bloody hot you know and people that go there you know for anzac day and you know we go there in august for the august offensive it's so stinking hot when you're there that's how we picture gallipoli but here we've got this whole section where it's then rain snow freezing cold winter it's bloody awful how did the men i mean after everything they'd been through the flies the mud you know the the heat the 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 bodies the dysentery after all of that, now they find themselves snow, ice, floods, a risk of drowning or freezing to death. I mean, what did that do to the men? Well, as you'd expect with men like this, because these are a different breed from us. And we, we, as military historians, the one thing you should first learn is that you're not a soldier. You never have been and you never will be. You're a weak, soft, useless article compared to these men. Um, uh, and this is 
And their first reaction is, what do you think a soldier does? This is where this is where Gary would definitely know the answer. What does a it's bloody awful. What does a soldier do? I think he, he has a laugh. He has a laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Private Ernest Lie of the Eighth Duke of Wellington's. By rights, I suppose we should all have been mer- miserable. For we were wet through and very cold. The younger ones talked of the feed they were going to have. I had a craving for hot muffins with piles of steaming butter, while those older men talked of the pints they would drink when they got back to their favourite pub. Now, we know how that feels. I could do with a pint in my favourite pub at the moment. Someone started a song which was taken up by all of us until you would have thought we hadn't a care in the world. At intervals during the night, we were called out and given a ration of rum. I do believe it was the rum that kept us alive that night. That's fine. All well and good. That's what we said. First half hour for me at the bus stop. I was all right, wasn't I? (laughs) But this is ten times colder. And eventually you can sing all you bloody like. You You can have a laugh all you like. But in the end, it gets too much for you. Far too much for you. Especially the way you described it, Pete, that they're living in very shallow trenches, tents. I mean, trying to. I mean, this is not a prepared position. This is not a position where they'd advanced and captured towns and built housing and barracks and places to live. I mean, they're living in shallow trenches or in tents. They're completely exposed to the weather. This just would have been hell on earth in a whole series of hells on earth. What I'd like to do is that I always feel, and I'm trying to do this in the book I'm writing for you, is I like to look at one group of people and how they respond. So I've picked, they're an obscure bunch, the 2nd, 3rd London Regiment. We just happen to have three good witnesses. And by good witnesses, I mean people who've got a knack of explaining what's going on. And the first one is uh, Private Law. Uh, and, you know, he's, uh, he's t- he talks it through and he says, you know, uh, uh, an officer's arrived. He's talking about this officer arriving and, and the officer's saying, oh, we've all had a rough time on the peninsula, but it's going to get a lot better soon. And, and then perhaps we'll be evacuated and all that, but it'll all be right soon. This is before the storm. Right. And then it starts to rain <laughs> and then then it starts to freeze. And then where they are. They're in, I think they're in the Asmac there. They're on the Suvla Plain anyway, in the bit that's going to get flooded. And then the flood hits them. And this is their colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Bendel. And he's got a dugout in the side of a trench. It's just a small dugout, you know, his personal dugout. He's a, he's a colonel. And he said, I heard a strange sound. Oh, I could have sworn it was the sea watching on the beach. But the sea and the beach were four miles away. I stood in the doorway and listened. As I listened in the flickering light, there was a curious slapping noise in the slit trench outside. And a great snake of water came round the curve, breast high, and washed me backwards into the dugout. I was off my feet for a moment, and then, sodden and gasping, I was in the doorway again. Another moment I was in the open air, and the horror of drowning under the dugout roof was gone. What was left was bad enough. The water was at my throat, waves of it licked at my face. I reached both hands to the top of the walls. Remember how deep and thin these trench- trenches are, but I couldn't get a hold there. My fingers tore through the mud, and then he gets away with it because he finds, see, the fire step, you know, gets up and he gets out. And... He, he's a good officer and he tries to fight. So he, he gets in touch with his company commanders, you know, because he's back at headquarters. And he says this, the captain of C Company in the support line told me many of his men were drowned, nearly all collapsed from cold. And he asked me what to do. I told him to keep his men together and moving about while it was dark. But at first sign of light to lie down behind the paradise of the trench. His voice had a desperate sort of ring in it, which told me more than his words did. And uh, Bendel then goes for a tour around the trenches. And he says this, No man's land was a lake. No attack would come over that for some time. North and south, the front trench was full of sullen brown water. and Behind it was no sign of life. Only here, where the hedge joined the front trench, were there any men. They were all blue with cold, shivering and wild-eyed. And he saw one really... This is the sort of thing that, you know, no matter how cold-hearted and cynical you are, they, you know, he saw this. Two brothers of C Company had died together. The arm of one was round the other's neck. The fingers held a bit of biscuit to the frozen mouth. It seemed a strange and inexplicable thing that these men who'd come there to fight and had fought bravely had been killed by the elements. And these were his men. He was the colonel responsible for these men. So he's taking it seriously, you know. And, and, and you know. Now, in front of him, he... 
the, the, the battalion has to move out, but they leave behind one company, <laughs> or what's left of one company, and two officers, a, a Captain William Wallace and Lieutenant Bernard Burge, and just 33 men to hold the front line, based around a thing called the Blockhouse. Now, I'm early on in my research, and I haven't quite tied down the blockhouse. It's near the Dublin Castle, and it may be the Dublin Castle at, at Suvla. I, I just don't know, and I'm not pretending at this stage to know. The story's the same. It's basically... Uh, it's it's a blockhouse. It's on slightly rising ground, and it was on a sort of island in the flood. And Wallace, Burge, and, and Law, Private Law, was with them. Uh, they've got just the rations they had in the haversack, just bully beef and biscuits, nothing else. And uh, what what uh, Captain Wallace, he left a great account, said they made a Dixie full of green water and bully beef into a sort of soup. And he said, why they all died of bully beef? He oh, but died of bully beef, that's one way. Died of dysentery, he didn't know. Um, anyway, he, he also said that, f funnily enough, the cold had cured his tummy pr problems. And I think, you know that, you've got a headache, <laughs> and then, and then you, 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 you know, you've woken up with a hangover, something which rarely happens to you, Matt. And, uh, you know, you, you're wandering around and you bang your knee on something, and suddenly your head stopped hurting because your knee's giving you a jib. <laughs> and I think this is the principle. He didn't notice his tummy problems anymore because he was freezing cold. Anyway, Captain William Wallace says this, and this is a, a quote I find almost difficult. They went. He went looking for food. And he went back to a cookhouse. And the sight around the next day was horrible. In our old cookhouse, we found five men who crept in there out of the wind, dead, frozen in their sleep. They looked like peaceful, sleeping children. They were not much more from an age point of view. Remember, average soldier, 18, 19, 20. Uh, in another place, we found two men tight in each other's arms. To get their identification papers, I remember prizing them apart with the helve of a pickaxe. In another place, two were dead, one man actually frozen, trying to poke a piece of biscuit in the other man's mouth. That is the same one as Bendel saw, almost certainly. I'm not saying it is, because I'm a historian, not a tour guide. <laughs> Tour guides always, everything's always the most exciting thing. Historians do tend to spoil it by saying, well... Perhaps. It's perhaps the same. You can't prove it, can you? Now, Wallace, Captain Wallace, he makes the blockhouse his headquarters. And this private law, I haven't found his first name yet. I asked on Facebook the other day and no one can track him down yet. So he might have been using an assumed name. I hope not. Um, he's sent to dig supporting positions. It's already apparent that when it comes to officers and men, this man is the, the man in charge, if you know what I mean. He is the go-getter. Anyway, he goes up and he... <laughs> He's got a little part about four or five men with him. And he says, and one goes bonkers. And this is not weakness. This is, I almost think it's normal to go mad after a day, day and a half of being frozen up to your waist in water. And he says, another man had been marching up and down with his mouth twitching and foaming and shouting, about ten! He'd evidently gone mad. But when I tried to persuade him to come back to me, <laughs> or go after the company, they, you know, when they're going. He took no notice. And then the sad bit. A few days previously, this chap had talked about being home for Christmas and said how much he would have liked to have had some of his mother's pastry. And I find that that's a lovely, sad touch. So, Laws, Wallace, C Captain Wallace is back at the blockhouse doing nothing, I'll be honest with you. And Laws is digging and improving the post, <laughs> you know, the, the the posts around it. Uh, he's turning them into a, a little trench and they're sleeping together in frozen bankers. There's a corporal with him, but he doesn't sound, seem to be doing anything. And they're huddling together for war. And, and this Laws is a right bugger because, you know, I said they're not shooting at each other. He is. <laughs> he's, he's, he's shooting at Turks. Any Turk that comes in sight has a shot at him. And Laws goes back to the cookhouse. I want you to notice the difference between the officer, who's, I'm not being rude, but not that great, or it's not his fault, he's not in good condition. And he says, uh, there was nothing to be found in the cookhouse in the shape of food, but the bodies of several dead were there. They'd not, they, they'd, been, they'd been taken there on the morning of the 27th for warmth from the fires and had died from exposure and frostbite. I love the way the stories blend. I covered the bodies up with a blanket. Didn't just leave them. <laughs> <laughs> and then he searches more and he says, I found a few sodden iron rations and a good supply of half a mo tobacco in the haversacks of dead men. The officer hadn't looked in the haversacks of the dead men because it was horrible. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I covered all the dead uh, as I, you know, uh, you know, 
And uh, and then he goes to visit Wallace and Burge in the blockhouse. And he says, just before dawn, I went to the blockhouse to see how things were going and to try and get warmed by the fire. They had a fire, the swans. <laughs> On entering this little roofless stone building, I beheld its occupants huddled round the fire and all seemed in a comatose state with smoke blackened faces. Getting neither satisfaction nor warmth here, I returned to the post. And... Wallace says, sorry to go on, uh, do you mind all these no, quotes? No, it's great, right. I'm loving it, mate, carry on. Wallace says, I like Wallace because, I'm going to be honest with you, Wallace, in this story, I'm not law. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> Private law. If I'm anybody in this story, I'm Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Wallace says this, I began to lose count of time. In fact, the last day we stayed, I definitely became a bit lightheaded for I remember vividly deciding that I was tired of eating with my fingers and wandering all over the place accompanied by a terrified orderly in search of knife, fork, spoon and plate. I got them, but my orderly only just pulled me to safety as a turkey sniper got our rage. <laughs> in this wandering about, I found poor old Howard, our adjutant, who died miserably of a bullet in the stomach. The turkey, you know, this is day three. It's turkey snipers starting to pick up. Uh, and then at this point, it all comes to an end. Law is, <laughs> in his communication tent, still digging, putting sandbags up and generally being useful. And uh, General Delisle approach, you know, um, I've forgotten his first name, Beaurevoir, Beaurevoir Delisle. Uh, he turns up and says, how are things? <laughs> I struggle to imagine what, I can imagine Law now. Half in his trench, up to his ankles in water or knees, <laughs> to stood to attention with this impeccable officer in front of him, saying, "How are you, young man?" <laughs> anyway, um, he um, he he said, uh, "Delisle says I'll get you relieved tonight," and they are relieved on the night of the thirtieth. You know, now this is the quote from Law. and he's talking about Wallace and Bird here. Unfortunately, our two officers and the majority of the men were delirious. So I had to arrange relief as best as I could. No mention of the Lance Corporal, remember. The Worcester officer, they were relieved by the Worcesters, did not seem to appreciate this is, again, I want you to imagine, Gary would have been good at this. <laughs> Gary, by, by my podcast, because he, he's a, a, a very bad soldier. <laughs> um, the Worcester officer did not seem to appreciate what we'd been through and wanted me to get the mess in the trenches cleared up and to hand over the trench mortar catapult. <laughs> and other trench stores. And after trying to do one or two things, I said he could take things as they were or leave them. <laughs> now, Wallace, this is the last quote from Wallace I've got. And then, sorry, we'll chat a bit. I'm sorry I've been dominating the chat, but I get excited with the quotes. Uh, and now, a last quote from Wallace, you know, and he's in a dreadful, dreadful state. And when, when Law said he was delirious, he was bloody delirious. And this is what Wallace said. I was lucky to be carried. Some of the frostbite cases did the journey on hands and knees. Can you just imagine that? Three miles. I was quite lightheaded when I started, for I remember shouting out that I could see a Turk's hand sticking out of a bush. Uh, it, turns out, it turns out to be a sock. You know. <laughs> he gets back to, to, the, to the beach and uh, and and... What he imagines is that uh, the people that he'd seen in that cookhouse were out to get him. You know, <laughs> I mean, he's having full on paranoia. Uh, and uh, he said, he said he's, he, I had a feeling at the back of mind that those five dead men in the cookhouse were up against me. And, you know, it's just barking mad. Um, just a, just a comment from outside, and this is uh, Lieutenant Owen Steele. I like to think, you know, he's going to mention a Worcester officer, and this is where a tour guide would say it was the same officer. <laughs> well, I'd like to. I, I'm just saying the Worcesters have several officers, and it might have been him. But Lieutenant Owen Steele, Newfoundland Regiment, said one of the Worcester officers told me four days after the storm that the previous day been down to the blockhouse in the lines held by 86th Brigade, where he'd seen many men de lying dead in the trenches and being walked over. He saw fully. 30 men standing up on the firing steps exactly as they were at the time of the storm frozen to death there was much work to do in clearing away and burying the dead that those bodies had not yet been attended to he said it was a very gruesome sight indeed and at the end you know on the beach the, the foreshore was covered in bits of bodies uh, mostly turks that had been washed down as mac dare and the other dares running down you know, and they were scattered along because they're going to the sea, be washed back up, you know, backwards and forward. And the sea had removed their clothes. So there's bits of bodies. It's awful. And, uh, you know, people had to bury them. 
Um, I, I, I want to finish by looking at a couple of ways that officers responded to this. Do you see what I mean? Because there's there's different ways. There's different types of officers. And do you know what? I'm not even going to say which of these ways is right or wrong because they're both men trying to save the, 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 the chaps under them. The first one is a complete bastard. <laughs> His name's Captain Thomas Watson of the 6th East Lancashire Regiment. And he is, <laughs> well, if you behave that like this with your employees, such as you've got left after the virus, but yeah, they would not, you'd not be popular. He said this, no possibility of sleep. The men who were fortunate enough to sleep were mostly frostbitten by morning. It was like slave driving. The men had to be kept awake. Poor beggars, dead tired, some of them, at the point of a good nailed boot. <laughs> he just went back kicking. <laughs> you simply had to keep stamping or moving in the freezing mud to avoid losing the use of your limbs. The Sabbath dawned. One of the most hopeless days ever dreamed of. Men died of exposure, too tired, in, ca in some cases too lazy to make the necessary effort to live. And that is one approach. And do you know what? He will have saved some of his men's lives. They will have called him a bastard, and I call him a bastard now. Uh, you know, but there you go. Now, the second one, it's nice to say, is that future Labour Party Prime Minister, Clement Attlee. He was there uh, and uh, he, he, he's got a different approach. He says this, men were brought into the headquarters in a state of collapse. However, a fire was got going and the CO hustled around getting the doctor to all the men who were bad into fairly dry dugouts. I made our men who would stand shivering run about and we had fairly frequent issues of rum. I found one line of dugouts fairly dry and collecting all the men who had been drowned out. I marked out, out, out new dugouts for them in a little hill under the trees and set them digging. I also collected a lot of old tins, issued fuel and some petrol and got the braziers going. I then had a foot inspection, made all the men with sodden feet rub them in with snow. Now you might say, well, that's a nice officer, but what's the difference between those two? One's in the front line and has no resources. There is no way of making a fire. There's no headquarters. There's no doctor. There's no good dugouts. And you know what? They're both great approaches. One man just has nothing, so he just has to force his men at the point of his boot to, to live. And that is it, live or die. And the other one, Atley, who you might have thought I was going to favour, but Atley just does it because he has more resources. He can be a good... He's still a good officer, but they're both good officers. Um... But there's one incident that I think people keep talking about rum. Now, medical science, you and I don't like spirits. Uh, I like a pint of beer. I love a pint of beer in the pub. No? But that people often go on about spirits. But medical science tells us it actually lowers your temperature. You know, it gives you a feeling of warmth. And there were some nasty accidents uh, at Suvla. Uh, Peter Ashton, of the, I think he was the Hertfordshire's. I can't, 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 haven't got it at hand. Yeah, it's a Hertfordshire regiment. And uh, this is almost where I'm going to finish with this, and then we'll talk some generally about it. And they had the rations sent to them in, in a lorry. <laughs> I'm not sure it is a lorry. I think it might have been a cart. But, and the people had just dumped it by the side of the road, and they'd very kindly sent a double rum ration for the whole regiment. And this had been found. Uh, and, and this is Peter Ashton, first Her Hereford, not Hertfordshire, Herefordshire. And this is Peter Ashton's quote, and it's awful. When morning broke, men began wandering about, as men will, and unhappily found the dump. Instead of telling somebody, or even eating the food, which would have been sensible, they broke open the rum jars and started in. The effect on empty stomachs and in that car was simply devastating. Filled with a spurious warmth, they lay on the ground and in many cases took off coats, boots and even tunics. Those in the immediate vicinity of the dump were quickly put in the bag. He means gathered up, you know, by, by the regiment. Um, but unfortunately, a majority had filled mess tins and water bottles and crawled off into the bushes to enjoy themselves. We fairly combed those bushes all the morning, but by the time we found them, all but a certain number were dead. I remember finding one man in particular in only his shirt and trousers, holding out an empty mug with a perfectly stiff arm, quite dead. Coming on top of everything else, it was heartbreaking. And there were 5,000 cases of frostbite at Suvla. At Suvla. Uh, and 200, sorry, 200 died or were drowned or frozen to. And actually, normally I think casualties are exaggerated. I think there were more than that from, you know, you keep reading in different regiments. Uh, of the, uh, we were talking about the 2nd and 3rd Londons. Um, 
when they came out, there were only 82 of them on their feet and only 42 of them were effective, i.e. ready for action. Uh, I'm sure law was one of them. <laughs> so, so, so that that's it. Men are crawling in. There's a, a quote. Last quote. Private H. Thomas. Uh, he, he he used to he was a stretcher bearer. They went out and he said this. Uh, uh, when we found them at the last gasp, crawling along as best they could on hands and knees, trailing frostbitten feet behind them, and it it's just awful. I cannot express to you how awful this was for the army at Suvla. They suffered at Anzac. It was hell on earth at Anzac. It was hell on earth at, at Hellas. Great. <laughs> but it was it was worse at Suvla. Uh, it, I, I, I find it difficult to imagine how bad it must have been. Pete, this disaster, there's no other way to describe it. After all the disasters at Gallipoli, this must have been the last nail in the coffin for the campaign at this stage, surely. You'd have thought so, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Up to this point, they've had uh, Munro come out. Munro said, get off, all of them. Get off Anzac, Suvla, Hellas as soon as possible before winter. Nothing happened. The, 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 the politicians and indeed Kitchener couldn't face it. So Kitchener comes out. He comes out, what, 12, 13, 14, round about then of November, i.e. two weeks before the... And uh, Kitchener goes, oh, dear me. <laughs> Uh, uh, worried about prestige in you know the Muslim world. Worried about that, but Egypt, India, but no, they're going to have to come off. You know, sends up report to that effect. That goes back to the war committee, and the war committee says, yeah, I suppose so. The cabinet, though, now what's in a cabinet? Politicians. Now, whether you're left wing or right wing, you should despise politicians or most of them anyway. And these politicians didn't want the responsibility of coming off. So they dillied and dallied. There's a song about they dillied, they dallied, you know, and they won't make a decision. That, and so they start, well, should we land somewhere else? Salonika, what, uh, should, how about we land at the Gulf of, well, how about we, Alexandra, what, what about, you know, anything, anything but take a decision. And so all the time, from when Kitchener sends his report back in mid-November, all the time they haven't made the decision. So, but... By this time, Munro, Birdwood, the other corps commanders, you know, had, had started preparations for evacuation, but they still hadn't heard. And you know what? It's a full week before they make the decision after the Great Storm. So the Great Storm, what, finishes generally the 1st of December. It's, it, the weather starts to pick up. It, it just becomes cold, not bloody freezing. And for another week... Those bastard politicians, and I know, we don't like swearing, any of us, but bastard politicians back in London trying to dodge responsibility, painting pictures of what might happen in the evacuation and refusing to accept what was happening, things like the Great Storm, what could happen if the German guns came through Bulgaria to blast them off, certainly at Anzac, where, you know... Um, they refuse to listen to that. All they're doing is, but what if it goes wrong? People will blame me. Bastards. Pete, it's just an extraordinary tale, and as I said, one that we don't even begin to consider could be part of the Gallipoli story. Just thank you so much for sharing it with us. I'm so looking forward to reading your book about the evacuation when it comes out in the second half That's of the year. Right. It's going to be fantastic, and this is a key element of that story, the great storm of November at Gallipoli. Mate, thank you so much just for taking the time to, uh, to tell us the tale. It's an absolute pleasure. And a, a lot, the one thing I do share with tour guides, and I am a tour guide myself, so I've got a bloody cheek, haven't I? But it, it's the chance to tell these stories. And when I go back to Gallipoli, and I hope that's this year, but we'll see, uh, I mean to go and see some of the graves that, of the men that, whose stories I've learned about in, in writing the book. You know, the story, people that just sad ends or just... just I just want to, to go and look at their grave and think... Hard luck, mate. You know, that's, a, that's awful. And um, let's hope it's soon, eh, Matt? Fingers crossed, mate. Thanks so much for joining us. In the meantime, until we can get back to Gallipoli, we've got great podcasts and great conversations to have. So, mate, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And you're a lot better looking than Gary. <laughs> thank you, Pete.